Today we begin an Advent series called, Why Christmas? And I'm sure everybody's got an answer for that. They have something in their mind why we celebrate Christmas. But today I would like to tell the story a little bit backwards. Rather than talking about uh, the manger scene and starting there, I want to start at the day that Jesus died. And so really actually on Good Friday, and on that Good Friday, Jesus is summoned before Pilate. And Pilate, he really does not want to crucify Jesus. And so he goes out to the audience and uh, the, the people, the rabble-rousers and everybody wanting Jesus to, to be crucified and tries to uh, have him turned over to their own process. And they say, no, we can't crucify him. Well, you got to do it. And he goes back into Jesus and he asks Jesus about being a king. And there's a little dialogue that goes back and forth. And then finally, uh, Jesus said, well, if, if, I were, if my kingdom were of this world, then my, my soldiers would fight. But my kingdom is not of this world. And he said, ah, but so you are a king. That's where we pick up right here. So then you are a king, Pilate said. You are right in saying, I am a king. I am a king. Jesus is king. Isn't that great? He is the king. But what intrigues me is what he says next. In fact... For this reason was I born, okay? And for this cause I came into the world. Ah, he's telling us now why Jesus came into the world. Here's the why behind why Christmas. Why Jesus came into the world is this, to testify to the truth, to the truth. Christmas is about the truth. Truth is a commodity that's kind of rare today, especially in politics. Isn't that right? Yeah, rare commodity. It was in his day too. Jesus said, this is the reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. So truth must be something really, really important. Truth. Just because it's important doesn't mean you're going to get it. Just because it's important doesn't mean a person's going to answer you truthfully when you ask a question. He says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Truth. At this point, Pilate responds, what is truth? Now, now Pilate's caught, caught himself in a dilemma. He believes that there is truth. He just doesn't know what is the truth? We live in a culture today where the whole idea that there is truth is being challenged. So if Pilate had been, you know, Gen X, millennial of our day, he would have said, come on, Jesus, is there really any truth? But he assumes that there is truth. He just doesn't know what it is. And Jesus is standing there before him and saying, this is is why I came into the world for truth's sake. So today I want to talk about truth. Truth as being the reason for Christmas. Why Christmas? For truth. I want to especially look at the word truth in the Gospel of John. And it's not any one text, it's selected text from the Gospel of John. And I want to begin in John chapter 1, verse 14. Now we're going back to the time of Christmas. We've gone from Jesus standing before Pilate at 33 years old, now that he's just been born, or even before he's born, and we're getting, giving this message about who Jesus is, and it says, the Word became flesh. That's what Christmas is all about. The Word becoming flesh. He made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of, of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Truth. Jesus said, this is the reason I came into the world. I'm telling you at the end of my life. Let's back up to the beginning of my life. At the very beginning, before I came into the world, it was so that I would reveal grace and truth. It's truth. Truth. Let's back up in the text from John 1, 14, back to verse 1 of the Gospel of John. Now we've gone all the way back to the very first verse of the Gospel of John, and he says this, in the beginning was the Word. I got the Greek word for word up there, it's logos. You, everybody knows that one, logos, logos. It, it's the word, the, the word logos is the word word. 
But if you'll notice in the text here, it says, in the beginning was the word, and word is capitalized because it's a proper noun. It's kind of like uh, the word jack. The, the word jack, I, I could say, hey, you know, I had a flat tire and I got in the trunk and got out my jack. So I could jack up the car. So jack, okay, is a noun. It's a noun about piece of equipment. It's a verb, it's an action. Hey, and then a guy by the name of Jack came along and he did it for me. <laughs> and now Jack is a proper noun. It's a name. This word, word, is a name. It's a name. And it says, in the beginning was the word. This person called the word was in the beginning. And, and it's very interesting. No matter what beginning you set, the text is saying that he previously existed because of the, the tense of the verb uh, and, the, and the mood of the verb. It tells us that he was already existing when the, the beginning took place. This person called the word already was. It says, and the word logos, the Greek, Greek word logos, the word was with God. Now the word with is the word pros. The Greek word for face is prosopon, so it's a shortened version of the word face. And the idea is here is you're with them face to face. So the word is face to face with God at the very beginning, whatever beginning you set, you back it up, whatever beginning, it's the beginning of all beginnings, when that beginning took place, the word was there with God. He says, and the word was God. Oh, this tells us something very important. The person by the name of the word is God. You could call the word God. This person you can call God. And he was with God, so there is God and God. And from those who have studied the Bible know that there is a trinity in the Bible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this designation of the name Word is the title that Jesus went by before he was born in Bethlehem, and they named him Jesus. He was the Word. The second person of the eternal trinity, co-equal with God the Father, co-equal uh, with God the Holy Spirit, Coexistent, existed as long as they did. He is God. He says he was in the beginning with God. So twice he's told us he was there face to face with God. And then he says something really important. Through him, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. You want to know who created you? Jesus, the Word, is the Creator. He is the one that created me. It's kind of like in the, in the Trinity. The Father planned it. The Son did it. He made us. I'm accountable to Jesus. He is my creator, my God. The truth is theological. That's what I'm trying to say here. There's theology here. God is truth. There is no lie, no air, no darkness. He is light in him. And so what God has done is he crashed into our darkness. He's crashed into the, the, the lies and the doubts and, and all the mis, miscommunication of, of, of all time. He's crashed in with the truth. And it's in a person, the Lagos, Jesus Christ. That's why when we go to John 1.14, it says, And the word, this God, became flesh. And he says, and he made his dwelling among us. Now, the word dwelling is the word tabernacle. He tabernacled. He pitched his tent among us. God was in the tabernacle of a human body in Jesus. And it says here, he says, we beheld his glory. In the Old Testament, over the tabernacle, there was a glory cloud that went up. And they called it Shekinah glory. It means the dwelling glory of God. And by day, there was a pillar of cloud. And by night, that pillar turned into a pillar of fire. And what that cloud said was, hey, God is in this tent. And this passage says, we have seen the glory of the one and only, the monogenes. The monogenes is the same uh, term used in the, John 3.16, which almost everyone has memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That only begotten son there is the monogenes. And here it says, he has the glory of being the only begotten. 
One text even says the only begotten God, he is identified with God, he is God. And he, we see his glory in the Son. And he adds this, full of grace and truth. Truth. There's my word, truth. Why Christmas? He said, I came into the world to reveal the truth. He is the truth. He, he's full of grace and truth. If you're going to access truth, you've got to go, go to him. You see, you jump down a few more verses in 117. It says, and the law was given through Moses. Remember the Ten Commandments? People say, well, you know, I live by the Ten Commandments. I'm going to tell you what, also, you're going to die by the Ten Commandments. <laughs> For if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. You bear upon yourself the curse of the law, and you die by the Ten Commandments. He says, for the law was given through Moses. Ah, but grace. Now, the word grace means giving you what you do not deserve. I do not deserve life. I have violated the law. Every one of us has. I mean, if you could keep the first nine, I know that the tenth one got you. You can't covet that's a pretty hard one. Paul said, hey, I could do all the rest, but that tenth one was killing me, man. That one's killing me. All the others are actions. That one's your heart. He said, I can't control my heart. I, you know, I, can, I can control my actions, but my heart. And it just runs crazy because I'm a sinner. And, and he says, the law kills, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The truth is theological here. It's theologically linked to Christmas. It's theologically linked to Christ. It's linked theologically to the word, which is linked theologically. This is God. God crashes into our world with truth embodied in a person, the Christ child. The truth. The truth. I want to suggest to you next that the, the truth is spiritual. Spiritual. In John chapter 4, Jesus said, I've got to go through Samaria. And he had a mission to go through Samaria. You never went to through Samaria because Samaria is where the Samaritans lived. And if you were Jewish, you had nothing to do with the half-breed people. They were very prejudiced in that day. But Jesus, who is not prejudiced because he's the truth, he sees people for who they really are without all the charades. And, and, and so he's, he's willing to go there and he's on a mission because at Sychar there's a woman sitting outside the well or she's getting water and J Jesus is there. As she pulls up... Jesus is there, and he says, give me something to drink. She's shocked. Why are you, a Jew, speaking to me, a Samaritan? He said, oh, if you knew the gift of God, and, and if you knew uh, of the water that I had to give, you would be asking me for a drink. Oh, come on, man. You don't, you don't have a bucket. How are you going to get any water out of the well? He says, well, the water I'm talking about springs up from within to eternal life. And she says, give me this, give me this drink. And, and he says, well, go call your husband. Oh, she said, I don't have a husband. <laughs> he says, that's true. You've got five, and the guy you're living with now, you've, you're, you're so disappointed in marriage, you're just living with the guy now. You're not even married to him. She perceives, oh my goodness, you know, he's exposed to her sin. She said, I perceive that you're a prophet. And she tries to change the subject. Isn't that the way it works when you start to get a little bit close with someone sharing your faith? The subject gets changed. Somebody walks in the room. The dog barks. Something happens. Change the whole, whole thing. She tries to change the subject. And she said, I perceive that you're a prophet. You know, our people say we worship in the mountains of Samaria. You say down in Jerusalem. Where's the right place to worship? She's changing the topic. And he says, and to make a long story short, I get right here. He says, Jesus said, the day is coming, and now is, that those that worship God must worship him in spirit. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. You cannot worship God in a lie. You can't. In a few moments, we're going to have the, the, the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper where you examine your heart and you see if there's anything between me and God, and I confess that, I get that out to God, and I make my heart pure. In fact, the text says, if you abuse this, this table, you bring upon yourself the chastising judgment of God in your life because he doesn't deal with the lie like you deal with the lie. He wants the truth. He wants you to be open, honest, and, and truthful be, before him. So whatever is there, you get rid of that. You get it out of the way. Christmas is about the truth. It's a spiritual reality that I am open, honest, transparent, and truthful with God and everyone else. Christmas is about the truth 
being liberating, being liberating. John chapter 8. Jesus is in a dialogue with the, with the Jews and the Jews who, he says to the Jews who believe, believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Not if you just say lip service, oh yeah, hey, I, I believe that Christmas story. Oh yeah, I, I go to church on Easter. I, I, I know the Easter story. It's not just giving lip service. Listen to what he says. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. We live in an age when People don't know the truth. God's made the truth pretty simple for us in a lot of areas. Now, in order that I would know what gender I am, he created my body with specific gender-specific parts. So there's no guessing or questioning. If I think to, you know, man, I, I don't buy that. I, I, I think I'm a female. Is that what's going on today? Uh, God said, well, well, hold on, time out. Just look at your body. I didn't put the wrong person, the wrong personality, the wrong person inside the body. You're saying I made a mistake in assigning the body that I gave you, whether you're a female or a male. Hey, if you, you've got, here, I got two cars out in the parking lot today because my wife and I drove separately. One is a Chevy and one is a Subaru. I like my Chevy now better than I like my Subaru. So maybe I want to make my Subaru a Chevy, so I just go take the logo off my Chevy, take the logo off my Subaru, stick the logo, uh, logo of my Chevy on the Subaru, and so now I declare my Subaru is a Chevy. And you know what you all think? Preacher's gone crazy. <laughs> He's deceived himself. You can do whatever you want to try to change the way you look, but you are what God's DNA says you are. That's who you are. We live in an age where if I want to believe differently, then that's the truth. And, and a truth for you may be different from truth for someone else, and so there, quote, is no truth. I'm telling you, there is truth. There's absolute truth. Jesus is the truth. And what I have found is when people come to Jesus and they believe in him and they hold to his teachings, God works within them and they change them. So if they had crazy thoughts, like I don't know my gender, I don't know my sexuality, or I'm attracted to the, my same sex, all of those things, all those disappear because the truth crashing into a person's life frees them from all that false nonsense that's in the world. The truth will set you free only, only if you hold to the teachings of Jesus. It sets you free. And you're free indeed. The truth is liberating. The truth is, that's why we have Christmas, that we might be liberated from the lie. This truth that I'm talking about is countercultural. It goes against the grain. I got here the one here. I'm going against the grain. In Jesus' day, they were accusing Jesus of being uh, of the devil. How could they get it so wrong? Here he's come from God. They're accusing him. He said, but Jesus, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. All of them were. He was a murderer from the beginning. What? Not holding to the truth. You know, the majority could be not holding to the truth, and you may be the only one standing up for the truth. Not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in them, in him, the devil, and when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You know, Jesus, you know the truth, the adversary, the devil, lives in the lie. Which side do you want to be on? The truth is sometimes unbelievable. 
it's like, I, I see that in a little further in that same passage. He says, yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Jesus was telling the truth. I try to share my faith as often as I can, and often when I'm sharing my faith, the person says, I just don't believe that. I cannot make them believe it. I can only share the truth, try to, try to make it as reasonable. I can try to emotionally, passionately persuade them, but I cannot make them believe. There will be those who will not believe the truth, and they may be in the majority that do not believe the truth. The truth is very personal, very personal. In John chapter 14, Jesus is going to ascend back to heaven, uh, go to the cross and die, and then go to heaven, and he says this to them, that I am the way, the truth. I am the way to, to, to heaven. I am the truth. It is personified. It's in a person. You see, if you have Jesus, you have the truth. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have the truth. The way a Christian observes the world and the non-Christian observes the world are radically different. It, it, even down to things like mathematics. I believe in mathematics. I believe two plus two equals four. Oh, the atheist, the guy that doesn't believe in, in, in Jesus, he says, well, two plus two equals four. We both agree, so are we, are we, we on the same page for the truth? Not at all. Not at all. For me, 2 plus 2 equals 4 means something much different for the guy over here that says 2 plus 2 equals 4. For instance, he believes, take two apples and another two apples, they equal 4. I say the same thing. We only agree formally because what we really believe behind that is radically different. He says these two evolved apples plus these two evolved apples equal 4 evolved apples. And I say, oh, no, 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 no. These two God-created apples and these two God-created apples equal four God-created apples. And so who's got the truth here? Oh, well, formally, so that I go to the store every time, you know, I, yeah, I want those two apples and those two red ones, two green ones. Oh, so you want four apples? I don't say, okay, listen, let me explain to you. I don't want your four evolved apples. I want the four created apples. I just work with them formally on the formal level. Yeah, I'll take the four apples. But what I mean by that, I know the truth. These did not evolve. God, in the beginning, created. Passages we said, everything that was made, everything that was made, was made by Jesus Christ. Those are Jesus Christ created apples, folks. The truth. He said, I am the truth. It's personal. It's personal. Everything in this world is ultimately related back to the truth, that he is the creator and he is the redeemer, and, and everything, everything that we do, and Christmas is about that. It's Christmas is about the truth crashing into our darkness, light into our darkness. It's very personal in Jesus Christ. The truth is also verbal. It's verbal in this sense. Jesus in his high priestly prayer says, sanctify them, the disciples, by the truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. If the teaching does not conform to the teaching of the word of God, the teaching is wrong and the word of God is true. I one time was saying that, that hey, if you find something in, you know, the, the teaching that I'm saying as a pastor and it contradicts what is in the Bible, then uh, you believe the Bible instead of me. A man came up to me and said, Pastor, I got, I got one for you. He said, you said this and I think the Bible says this, so which one is it? I pondered that and I said, oh my goodness, you're right. I'm wrong because this word is truth. This word is truth. Not my opinion. This word is truth. That's why last year, at the beginning of the year, or this, this last, last January, we try to get everybody to read through the Bible. Because when you read through the Bible, you're reading through the truth. The truth. And the truth will set you free. Your word is truth. It's verbal. God speaks to us. The truth is decisive. It is also divisive. I didn't know which one to put here, so I put decisive. Jesus, remember, he's standing before Pilate. 
You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this very reason I was born. For this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Everyone on the side. What? You got to pick sides. There's where it's divisive. You have to pick a side. Do you believe in the word of God and do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe or do you not? Now, Pilate tried to evade making the decision. So he says, oh, well, what is truth? Most of you know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it says, uh, Christ Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on the Son is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. You see, you don't stand neutral. You can't pass the buck here. Pilate saying what is truth didn't mean that he wasn't accountable. He was standing there face to face with truth, with truth embodied, tabernacled in flesh, face to face with truth. And he says, oh, what is truth? What is truth? You can't pass the buck. He's condemned already. He's already chosen the side, and he's on the wrong one. He says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So are you listening? Are you listening to him? What side of the truth are you on? This book, Christmas, reveals the truth. The truth that Jesus is God. It reveals the truth that he is worshipped in spirit. It reveals the truth that he is free. He frees the worshiper. The worshiper who lives counterculturally and the one who does so with an incredible faith so that he has his faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and in his word. That's what Christmas is about. Christ Jesus came into the world to reveal the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me, Jesus said. Here's my final question. Are you listening? Are you listening? He's speaking. Are you listening? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for the word of God and the truth. The word is the truth. The living word is the truth. Christmas is about the truth. Why Christmas? To truth us. To tell us the truth about who we are and who you are. To tell us how we can have eternal life and salvation. How we can have a, a relationship with the true and living God. Lord, we don't want to be deceived. We don't want to be lied to. We want your word to govern our lives so that we will be the people who follow and hold tenaciously to the, the teachings of Jesus and we know the truth and it sets us free. Father, today we ask you to open our eyes and see the truth. Open our ears so that we will be listening and we'll be on the side of truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.